how that must feel to go to the Olympics. You train just like the person next to you. You train just like Simone Biles. You train just like the best swimmer. You train just like, Ray, well, maybe Raygun didn't train, but whatever she did, she did. Um, but you don't come home with the goal. You come home with defeat. The Olympics is this place where you have celebration and you have lamentation coexisting. And man, if I think about it, that's what life is like. Life is this crazy combination where we have these high highs, and so do the people in our lives. But man, all of us also experience these moments of low lows. There's a verse in Romans 12, 15 that I want to anchor us in, not just this week, but next week. We're kind of doing a twofer where we're going to kind of tie these two ideas together. Romans 12, 15 says that we should rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. So we're going to do a two-parter. This week, we're going to talk about Lamentation. What does it look like to weep and to weep with those who weep? And then next week, we're going to talk about celebration. And the reason for that is because both of these are part of everyone's human experience. Both of these are ways you can hear from God. And both of these have deep roots in the people of God. There are spiritual practices, ancient practices that work when it comes to being honest about the pain in life and when it comes to celebrating with God. So we're going to be leaning into that. So today, I've got an encouragement for you, and I'm going to give you an assignment at the end. And the encouragement is this. I want you to get all up in your feelings with God. I want you to practice getting all up in your feelings, bringing all of that to God. And I believe that as we do that, we will experience God. And in fact, I would say there are some things about connection to God and hearing from God you can only experience if you're willing to lean in to the practice of lament. Let's pray. God, I pray that you would use this time um, to meet us in the place that we are. God, I know that some people who are listening right now are riding high. And maybe the idea of grief or the idea of lament seems so far from what they're experiencing right now. But I also know that given the size of our church and just the diversity of our church, there's there's bound to be people who are listening to this right now who are in a low period, who are hurting, who are grieving, who are wrestling with something in their life that's causing pain. And so, God, I believe that whether we're at a high or a low, you want to you teach us something today. You want to teach us something about you, and you want to teach us something about how we can hear from you. And I pray that that would happen. In Jesus' name, amen. So what do I mean when I say lament? Here's a simple definition Lamenting is dealing honestly with God's pain, with, with life's pain. Lamenting is dealing honestly with life's pain. If I were to meet you in the atrium, talk to you, see you at a restaurant, and I said, hey, how's it going? What's your typical answer to that question? Hey, how are you doing? How are you doing? We got some people in here that are like, hey, I'm fine. Who, who are some I'm fine people? We got some I'm fine people. You got anybody in here that's like, I'm doing great. Like, no matter what, they're like doing great all the time. They could be bleeding out, but they'll still tell you, I'm doing great, right? You know, there's some people that are like that, right? And, and hopefully you are doing great. You know, then you got some people who are like, hey, I'm maintaining. You got some maintainers in here. We got some people who like maintain. Then you have people who say things that I just really don't understand. Have you ever heard this one? I've asked some people how they're doing, and they say, man, if I was any better, I'd be a twin. You ever heard that one? <laughs> that, that, I think that's like a Southern or Midwestern thing. I never heard that until I got to Cincinnati. But like, I love it. I love it. I kind of get it. I kind of get it. And then you got people who say things like fine and dandy like cotton candy. Actually, I just made that up. That's pretty stupid. So hopefully you don't say that when someone asks you a question. But here's the thing. You may be great. You may be wonderful. But there are times, honestly, don't we answer that question a little bit inauthentically? What, what would it look like? to be honest about that question. Because here's the thing, I think one of the knocks on people of God can be, man, we're just so Pollyanna. Everything's always wonderful. I'm blessed and highly favored. And yes, we are. And we have a lot to celebrate as people of God. And yet, there's a part of us that can feel to people disconnected from the reality of life. And here's what's interesting about that as you think about the way that plays out, particularly in the American church. There's a great book called, the, uh, called Prophetic Lament. And in it, Sung Cham Raz, the author, he says this. He says, the American church avoids lament. The power of lament is minimized, and the underlying narrative of suffering that requires lament is lost. But absence doesn't make the heart grow fonder. Absence makes the heart forget. 
The absence of lament in the liturgy and the spiritual practices of the American church result in the loss, let me find myself, in the loss of memory. We forget the necessity of lamenting over suffering and pain. We forget the reality of suffering and pain. In fact, I want to show you this by running some numbers. So I want to take a look at some numbers around lamentation. So how many people grew up like Presbyterian, Baptist? You grew up in a church, they had hymnals in the pews, right? You even know what a pew is, right? Yeah. Well, in those hymnals, someone did the math, and what they found is that 80 to 85 percent of the Baptist and Presbyterian hymnals are celebratory songs. And again, we have a lot to celebrate. I don't know if you know this or not. I believe Jesus actually died for me. <laughs> and he rose again. And that I have a relationship with Jesus. I, I, that's worth celebrating. So, so I'm not saying we should be sad people. I'm just saying 80 to 85 percent are celebratory happy hymns. Only 15 to 20 percent of hymns in the Baptist and in the Presbyterian hymnal books are about suffering and pain. Just stop and think about that. Stop and think about the experiences of life and what that says. And it's actually even worse when you think about the songs that are sung at churches like Crossroads. So they looked at contemporary church, modern worship, kind of songs that we would sing. 95% of them are celebratory. Victory, it's all going to turn out great. It's awesome right now. Jesus is my best friend. It's great. It's awesome. 95%. Now here's the thing. There is a song book in the Bible. It's called the book of Psalms. And 50% of the Psalms are lament. I, I'm just going to say, Jesus was formed by songs where 50% of them dealt with the suffering and the pain of life. You and I are being formed by only 5%. I think there's a problem. <laughs> and I think I'm responsible. As a pastor, I'm responsible. I'm giving this message because I believe we run the risk of being malformed if we don't talk about how to face pain honestly with God. In fact, I'm giving this message because a friend of mine challenged me. He said, Chuck, I've heard you talk and preach about a lot of things. I've never heard you give a message on grief. And at first I wanted to be defensive, and then I was like, you know what, you're right. In all the years that I've been speaking, I don't think I've ever given a message on grief. And I was like, you know what? When I have an opportunity, I'm going to change that. Because again, I just know what life is and what life brings. And I think a lot of us would say, yeah, I can use some formation on how to feel pain honestly with God. Because here's the thing. When we don't lament, that pain goes somewhere. Somebody put it really well. They said, those who do not turn to face their pain are prone to impose it. Hurt people hurt people. And I would argue, you either impose it, or sometimes, even worse, you ingest it. That some of the anxiety, not all. Some of the depression, not all. Some of the addiction, not all. But some of it is because we haven't learned how to deal with pain, how to deal with it in a healthy way. I mean, basically, we have to think about what's the spiritual alternative here. And the spiritual alternative is you get all up in your feelings with God. When it comes to pain, you really only have four options. You can ignore it. You can complain about it, you can feel it, or you can feel it with God. And I want to submit to you that feeling pain with God is a spiritual practice. It's a lost art, but it's one I want to help us reclaim today. Because the Bible is full of people that we call heroes who understand that life has to include lament. Give you some examples. Elijah. Elijah is an amazing prophet in the Old Testament. Right after his highest moment of victory, he's won a victory for God. There's been all these prophets that were false prophets. They all get slaughtered. Like, he's ready to clean house. And yet the queen, Jezebel, threatens his life. And Elijah runs to the wilderness, afraid for his life, feeling alone. This is what he says in 1 Kings 19.4. He says, it is enough now, O Lord. Take away my life for I am no better than my father's. This is God's hero saying, God, I feel so alone. I feel in so much pain. I would rather you just take my life. If you know the story of Job, Job is a person who suffered immense pain, immense pain in the Bible. And Job says this honestly in Job 3.16. He says, or why was I not as a hidden stillborn child 
as infants who never see the light. Job says, God, if this is the life that you drew up for me, why was I even born? It would have been better for me not to even be born. Jeremiah the prophet, by the way, it kind of sucked to be a prophet. I don't know if you're seeing that as a trend. Like, I know some of us are like, man, I want to be a prophet. Good on you. Good, good on you. Jeremiah was despised. His message from God wasn't popular. And at one point, they threw him into a well to die. And Jeremiah, in that place of difficulty, says this in Jeremiah 20, 14. Cursed be the day on which I was born. The day when my mother bore me, let it not be blessed. I'm reading these so you, so you can see that the heroes of our faith understood lament and were willing to be honest about the painful moments with God. In fact, you could say Jeremiah wrote the book on, on lament. He literally did. There's a book in the Bible called Lamentation. <laughs> and it's five poems that Jeremiah wrote after the city where he lived was utterly devastated by an enemy. Can you imagine? I'm in Cincinnati. I know there's people watching from other places, but can you imagine what if in the last 48 hours, Cincinnati had been decimated? Not the football team. It's a whole other story. <laughs> I'm talking about the city. I'm saying what if the city had an army run through it and the army that ran through it literally was slaughtering kids on the street. There was bloodshed and we were left in the rubble of the city. This is the situation in which Jeremiah writes the book of Lamentation, a place of deep, deep pain. And as I read that book, I see for us a roadmap, a roadmap for how we can deal with pain honestly before God. Four things that I see as practices of lamentation. First is you need to state your complaint. State your complaint. Look at what it says in Jeremiah 120. He says, look, O Lord, for I am in distress. My stomach churns. My heart is wrung within me because I have been very rebellious. In the streets, the sword bereaves. There's been so much violent that even the weapons of violence are sad, he's saying. And in the house, it is like death. And then he says this in Lamentations 2.5. He says, the Lord has become like an enemy. He has swallowed up Israel. He has swallowed up all its palaces. He has laid in ruin its strongholds. He has multiplied in the daughter of Judah mourning and lamentation. I'm so glad that words like this are in the Bible. Because you notice that Jeremiah in that last verse is saying, God, it's almost like you are our enemy. It's almost like you have been the one that wanted to bring this pain on us. I love the honesty of these heroes of faith. Because I don't think it's heretical to be direct and honest with God. I think God can take it, and I think God desires for us to be honest with him about the things that are struggling, the things that are hard in our life. I think it's okay for you to say, God, I committed to this marriage, and I kept my end of the deal. But this person betrayed me. What am I to do with that? I think that's the kind of honesty God wants from us. I think it's okay for you to say, God, you know that we want children. Why is it that we had another miscarriage? God, what are we to think about your desire for us to be parents? It is okay to be honest with God. It is okay to say those kind of things. It is okay to state your complaint. In fact, I think you have to. I think you have to. If, if I'm going to stay in relationship with God in the hardest things, it can't be like it was when I grew up in church. When I grew up in church, there was a whole set of things where they were like, well, you can't say that in church. You can't say that in church. And some of the things I just said up here are things that somebody would have pulled me to the side and said, you can't say that about God. You can't tell God like that. You can't pray like that. I'm telling you, you can. And I'm not telling you only because I believe it. I'm telling you because I see it in the scriptures. I see it in the people who God loved. I see it in the people who God lifts up. I see it in the people who God comforts in the midst of their pain. It is okay to state your complaint. Think about it this way. Any good physician needs to know exactly where the pain is if they're going to heal it. And here's the thing. God knows where the pain is. You stating it honestly says to God, you see where the pain is too. And when you're willing to be that honest with God, man, I just think that that is a powerful experience that can help you hear from God and experience an intimacy with him like you can't any other way. So first, state your complaint. Second, express your emotions. Express your emotions. Look at what it says in Lamentations 2.11. Jeremiah says, my eyes are spent with weeping. My stomach churns 
And this is so descriptive. He says, my bile is poured out to the ground because of the destruction of the daughter of my people, because infants and babies faint in the streets of the city. What? It's kind of gross, but it's a very honest picture of a man who is expressing his emotions. I have this up here because this has become a really important thing in my life. It's the feelings wheel. And I don't know about you, but I, I need help naming my feelings sometimes. Um, my, my wife, I love her, and one of the things I love about her is she has had a steadfast commitment. And I love the, the analogy she uses. She, we have two boys, we have a daughter. She believes this for all our kids, but specifically when we just have boys, she said, Chuck, I'm determined that my boys will be able to feel and express emotion. That's really important to me. And she put it to, yeah, you can, you can clap for that. And she has done an amazing job at that. Um, in fact, she says it this way, and she got this analogy somewhere. She said, most men have about eight crayons in their emotion box. <laughs> we're happy, we're mad, or we're hungry. I don't know. I mean, maybe there's more, but like, that's, you know, that's, and, and unfortunately, society, and again, this might be gross generalizations, but I do think this is true, that society has conditioned men to be an eight box crayon kind of feeler. And my wife has said, I want to raise boys who have all 64 crayons in their box and they can express them. And so we are raising boys that have the ability to name their emotions. And let me just tell you, it's working. Sometimes it's working way too well. My sons say things to me where I'm just like, I, wow, I, okay. Uh, wait, let me go get the feelings wheel and let me catch up to you in terms of how you're feeling. I know I need tools like this to help me to be honest about my emotions. Because sadly, some of us grew up in families where this was suppressed. And I want to just lament that. I just want to say that if you grew up in a family where you were limited in the emotions you were allowed to express, that was not God's heart for you. Man or woman, that was not God's heart for you. And that there is something powerful about us opening up to God and being able to feel with God. In fact, I want to do an exercise right now to help us with this. So I want you to think about your last seven days. It's going to be up on the screen here. Um, and I want to say right up front, I'm not asking you to say this out loud, so this is just a thought exercise. But I want you to think about the last seven days of your life. And I'd like for you to identify three emotions from these six that you felt this week. Maybe this was a great week, and you're like, oh, man, yeah, joyful. Maybe, maybe something went your way, and you're like, I did, I did feel powerful. Maybe for you, it's like, no, I... I, I, I'm scared. There's some stuff in my life that's uncertain, and I don't know. I got a diagnosis or something happened this week. I want you to name three emotions that you felt. And so here's the challenge. We're going to expand this feeling wheel, and now I want you to name three more. So if you felt powerful, did you feel like, hey, I'm, I'm faithful, I'm following through on something? Did you feel important? Did you feel hopeful, appreciated, respected? or proud, I want you to go a level deeper and name three more emotions that you felt this week. Now for some of that, us, this is easy. For others of us, this is a stretch. And I guess what I wanna say to you is, I wanna encourage you to stretch your emotional crayon box. To think about coming to God with words and feelings that maybe you've never expressed to God. Because I believe this. I believe that any time there is rich lament, it is rich in emotions. So yes, you have to state your complaint. Be honest for God. But then you also have to express your feelings to God. And he wants you to express your feelings to him. The third thing is ask God for help. Ask God for help. Look at what it says in Lamentations 5.21. Jeremiah says, Restore us to yourself, O Lord, that we may be restored. Renew our days as of old. You know, I love the song that we sang at all of our sites this weekend. Oh God, my God, I need you. Oh God, my God, I need you now. Like, I love that because it's asking God for help. It, it, it's not saying that we have the pithy answers. It's not necessarily doing a rote prayer, although there's nothing with a rote prayer, but there's something about just a raw, honest, hey, God, I just need help. God, I just need you now. I need help. 
And we see Jeremiah doing this, and I think it's really powerful. Here's what I've learned about asking God for help. I think God loves it when we are specific. I think he appreciates it when we're persistent. And oftentimes, he answers in ways that are surprising. I was thinking about that this week as I think about loss and people who have left my life. This is um, September and October are interesting months for me because um, in both of those months, not in the same year, but in both of those months, I lost, within a close period, I lost two people that were really, really special to me. Um, One of them, um, and some of you may remember her, her name was Kathy Beecham. And Kathy Beecham was a leader around Crossroads, and she was like a spiritual mother to me. Um, And Kathy's birthday was this week, and so every every time when her birthday comes, it's just an opportunity for me to remember what she meant to me, what she meant for my life, and and it's it's like I miss her. I miss her. Um, And here's what's interesting. I I've learned this as I've gone through grief, that you lose the person, right? You can't engage with them in the way that you could when they were alive and in the flesh, but you never lose the nuggets and the imprint that they made on your life. Does that make sense? And so I, like, I've not had a vision of Kathy since she died. I haven't, like, engaged with the spirit since she died. That's not what I'm saying. But here's what has happened often. I've been in a situation where I'm like, man, I really wish I could have asked Kathy about this. And God will meet me in that situation, and he will bring to memory things that Kathy has said to me. And his, I don't know if this happens with you, but I hear him in her voice. I hear her, like, it's just like I remember her voice. I remember what she sounded like. Again, nothing, nothing, this isn't a woo-woo thing. I'm not getting woo-woo on you. I'm just saying, like, this is true. Another, another um, thing is coming up is the anniversary of my father's passing. And actually, I didn't know you were going to be here, Jim, but um, we're going to show this picture. I am so thankful, Jim. I think this is the best gift you ever gave me. The guy in the front row who took this picture is here. Um, it's the best gift you ever gave me. I love this picture for so many reasons. One of the reasons I love this picture is because in the same way that my wife was committed to raising boys that had 64 box, 64 crayons in their box, my dad always, always kissed me on the cheek. He was determined, and my dad did not have that experience in his life, but he was determined to raise a son who was comfortable showing affection to his father and the father showing affection to his son. And I do the same thing with my boys. They hate it, but I'll do it anyway because I just want them to know it is okay for your father to kiss you on the cheek. It is okay for your father to love you and hug you and snuggle with you. Like, that is okay. And so I appreciate that picture. But same thing with my dad. There are things that I'm experiencing now as my boys get older. And I'm like, oh, man, I wish I could have ran. My- Dad, how crazy was I as a teenager? This would be really helpful to know. Like, what were the boundaries that you needed with me? And no, I can't. I haven't had a vision of my dad. No, but, but, but I remember the things my dad taught me. And they come to mind. In fact, sometimes I'm saying things out of my mouth to my kids. And I realize, like, oh, that was, I'll tell them, like, that was Papa. Pop Pop used to say that to me all the time. I, I don't know where I pulled that from. That, he said that to me when I was 17 years old, but it came back. And the reason I'm bringing this up is because when we ask God for help, I think one of the things is important. It's not that the situation necessarily gets fixed. A loss is a loss, and it will always be a loss. People who are important to us will always be important to us. We will always miss them, but God has a way of meeting you in your loss when you lament and when you ask him for help that truly is healing. And I think God wants to do that more. And so what I see in the life of Jeremiah is as he states his complaint honestly before God, as he expresses his emotions to God, and as he just asks God for help, he gets the supernatural thing that only happens when you're willing to face life's pain with God. Jeremiah and you, even in the midst of the hard things in life, can rest in trust. You can rest in trust. The book of Lamentations is written kind of interestingly. So the first and the last um, poems, there are five of them, the first and the last poems are really kind of state the complaint, express the emotions. The second and the fourth are more of that kind of like, hey, here's what I'm wrestling with. But the third chapter in the middle of the book kind of stands as a gem. You could think about it as a pyramid. And it's all about God's faithfulness. 
It's all about God's faithfulness. I love that on this side, there is pain and difficulty. In this side, there is grief and loss. But somewhere in the middle, there's a deep root, a deep stream that will remind us that we can rest and trust. Because even in the worst times of our life, our God is still faithful. Look at what he says in Jeremiah, I mean, in Lamentations 3, 21 through 24. He says, but this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. I love this. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion. He's saying, God is enough for me, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. There is a place in the midst of grief, not when you avoid grief, but when you walk through grief, there is a place of resting in the trust that says, God, even though this is hard, you are still faithful. Even though this is difficult, I am not alone. Even though this is challenging, you are with me, and you will strengthen me. Let me tell you how this came alive this summer for me. Um, I had the opportunity to go to Montana for a father-son experience with my younger son. I did this with my older son a couple years back, and when they turned 13, just really blessed to be a part of an amazing ministry, New Frontier Ministries, who um, does amazing father-son experiences. And so I got to do this again with my son, Samuel. And part of this is really helping boys understand that the way to live as a true man is to live fully as a beloved son of God. And that Jesus, therefore, was the perfect man because Jesus perfectly lived in the love of God. And because of that, he was able to live as a full man. And so we're kind of walking the boys through sets of experiences and whitewater rafting and doing all the things. It's super cool. But I was there this year, and we're doing these conversations. And one of the conversations was around how Really, the way that God forms us, and I don't think this is just true for men, but we were talking about it in the context of men, I think this is true for everybody, is God forms us in the wilderness. He forms us when we step out into the adventure, into the unknown. Think about every great story that you love. I mean, isn't that the arc of every great story? The hero leaves their familiar settings, they step out into the unknown, they face challenge after challenge, and difficulty after difficulty, and it's through those challenges and those difficulties that they are shaped and formed into the hero that we know. And it's the same in our lives. I think that's why that story resonates in so many of the films and books that we love. And so we're talking about this, and we're talking about how, so if we really want to allow God to grow you, you've got to be willing to step into the adventure. And as the guy who's leading this is talking about it, my inner, like my my heart was just like, "Mm," I was resistant. I did not want to hear this. And the reason I didn't want to hear this is because I feel like I've been out on the edge a lot lately. And I've been taking bullets, and it sucks. I don't want to step out in the venture. I mean, literally, I'm like, God, I don't, I don't want to do another risky thing. I don't. <laughs> and even, like, my tone was affected. I'm just like, man, what's going on? So one of the beautiful things is it's a beautiful setting like this. And so I was literally walking out of the house, and this, was, this wasn't the exact view, but it was a mountain in the distance, beautiful plains, just a peaceful view. And I had some time with God alone. And in that time, I just began to say, God, What's going on in my heart? What, what, what's going on? And I'm journaling this. And as I'm journaling, it's almost like God took over the pen. And what began to be written felt like it was from God. And God said, the reason that it's been hard for you to receive this call to adventure is because this is the first time you stopped this year and let yourself lament the losses. And so I literally, it was almost like God gave me back the pen. And I remember I wrote down 12 things, 12 things that were hard, 12 disappointments this year, just these things that have been so painful for me to walk through. And the only way I can describe how I felt on the other side of that opportunity to lament with God is, you know when you have a drain that's been clogged with too much hair? And like before you unplug it, like it's just nothing's getting through, right, you know? But then when you have a chance to declog that thing and you pull it out, man, it just flows, right? And that was what it was like. It was like, man, everything in me that was kind of like resistant, not able to receive from God, oh my gosh, my heart opened up. My heart expanded. And not only was I able to be a better father to my son that week, but I got to be a son who was loved by his father that week. It was so needed for me. But the pathway to that was I had to sit with God in the pain. And I think that's what Jesus is inviting you to do. I think that's what Jesus is inviting us to do, is to be people who sit with him in our pain. Look at what Jesus says in Revelations 3.20. He says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. 
If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. The most intimate thing you could do when those words were written was sit down and have a one-on-one meal with someone. It was an act of intimacy. And maybe you're in here today and you're living on the high. Life's good. Things are rolling. When somebody asks you how you're doing, you say, I'm doing great. It's true. It's really how you're doing. But maybe you're in here and that's not your honest answer. Maybe you've experienced a loss. Maybe life's just hard. Maybe you're just slogging through. And you're like, I I want joy. I I don't know when I'm going to have joy again. I want you to know, wherever you are, Jesus is knocking at the door of your heart. There's an invitation that he has for you. And the invitation is, if you will open the door, if you will sit with me in the real pain, in the real difficulty, wherever you are in your life, I will come and I will give you more of myself. I will give you more of my love. I will give you more of my insight. I will give you more of my comfort. I will give you what you need. So my challenge to you this week is to get all up in your feelings with God, with God. And so here's what we're gonna do on the screen. I got an exercise and I'm gonna invite you to do. Sometime this week, I'm gonna ask you to carve out 30 to 60 minutes and actually practice this. And so what that's gonna look like is, and I would say for this to, you know, to work, I find it's best if you have a journal or some paper, something to write with, and something where you can search the internet. I'll tell you why. So what you're gonna do is start your journal with a prayer to God that is stating your complaint. You're just gonna say, God, here are the specific things that I'm wrestling with. And I would say pick one thing. Maybe it's a relationship that is broken. Maybe it's a disappointment that happened recently. Pick one thing and go deep with God on that one thing. Maybe take five minutes, 10 minutes, just to begin the journal, state your complaint. Then next, express your emotions. If you Google feelings wheel, this will come up. And I wanna encourage you to do that. Print it out, keep it on your phone. And I want you to go deeper. What are the five, six emotions that are really how you're feeling about that specific situation? Don't hold back. And then ask God for help. Think about it this way. If it was a conversation, and I believe prayer is a conversation with God, what would you, how would you respond if God said to you, after you state your complaint, after you express your emotions, if God said, what do you want me to do for you? How would you answer that question? Write it down. Write it down. And then I want you to take an opportunity to rest in trust. Trust. What does that look like? Find truths in the Bible that relate to the thing you're struggling with. And that's where I think it's helpful if you have an ability to search the internet. You can do this on your Bible app. Some of you know how to use the tools in your Bible to find verses that are related to different subjects. Or maybe you have one of those study Bibles and it has a list of like, hey, if you're dealing with this, look at these verses. But this is what you want to do. Let's say if you're dealing with disappointment, I would say put in the search verses, Bible verses on disappointment. Find one of them that speaks to you, write it in your journal. Maybe it's verses on handling anxiety. Put that in the search, find a verse that speaks to you, write it in your journal. This is a very tangible, tactile way to get up in your feelings with God. And then I want you to finish by just sitting in quiet, just being present with God and being open to what he wants to say to you. This exercise is not about fixing something. This exercise is about you experiencing the presence of God. And I think God wants to show up in a powerful way if you're willing to do this. So I'm gonna invite you to stand wherever you are. We're gonna sing the song to all of our sites that we started with, or the song that we ended with, I should say, the same God. Maybe for you, this song can be an entryway into this time of lament. You can go to Spotify, and if you look up Same God, you'll find this song. Maybe you want to start that time, that 30 to 60 minutes, listening to this song again, letting that be a place that grounds you as you step into this exercise, this time with God. I believe God's going to show up. I believe God's going to speak to you. I believe God's going to comfort you. Maybe you'll experience him in a way that you never have before. So God, I pray that as we do this, as we get ready to not just hear this word, but to do it this week, that we would find it to be true, 
that you are the same God. You're the same God that comforted Elijah. You're the same God that comforted Job. You're the same God that comforted Jeremiah. You are the same God and you will comfort us. I pray this in Jesus' name, amen.